Thank you. Um, and I should say this is joint work, uh, much of what I'm going to talk about, with George, who is somewhere, Ramya, who is there, and uh, Stephen, who is uh, applying for PhD programs. So if you like it, admit him. Um, so OK, like, like machine learning is getting pretty good. Uh, you know, here we are in 2024. We're very good at predicting many kinds of things. Uh, we can predict the contents of images. We can caption them. We can uh, complete text prompts. We can decide whether it's a good time to apply the brakes or not. Maybe we can sort of try to figure out the expected profit or loss from granting a loan at different rates. Uh, but, you know, like, as we all know, even in these applications where machine learning is pretty good, it's far from perfect. And so we should ask the question, short of perfection, like, what are the, you know, what's like a list of things we might want from machine learning? Um, so, of course, we shouldn't, even though we can't be perfect, we shouldn't give up on accuracy. Accuracy is very important. So our predictions should be close to correct as measured by, you know, relevant loss functions. Um, and, oh, and by the way, like, it, it's sort of straightforward to think about uh, what accuracy means. A, a theme here is going to be that, you know, each of these things we want needs careful definitions. Okay. So, um, okay, so accuracy is great. Uh, we also would like privacy, ideally. We'd like that our predictions shouldn't reveal too much about our training data. And initially, it might have been hard to think about how to formalize this, but I would say a, a couple of decades of, of work in differential privacy has done a really good job here. We'd like our predictions to be fair. That's much of what this collaboration is about, but questions here start to get a little bit more fuzzy. Maybe you know, that means that our predictions, or maybe just our predictions when acted on, um, shouldn't disproportionately harm one group over another. Of course, then we need to ask what constitutes harm. We want that our predictions should be robust. What does that mean? Well, people formalize it in different ways, but maybe you sort of want that your predictions shouldn't break down when the future differs in some important way from the past, when you know, your training data isn't perfectly representative of the future. Of course, everyone knows we'd like our models to be explainable, but nobody knows exactly what that means, what is an explanation. And one thing that has become popular, at least, you know, like amongst NSF program managers, is that machine learning should be trustworthy. Many of us claim at various times to work in trustworthy machine learning. But what exactly is the, the semantics of the promise that we are supposed to trust? And, um, you know, okay, so in this talk, I want to uh, try to attach some little bit of semantics to that. And so here's sort of the proposed promise. Like our predictions, of course, are not going to be perfect. But nevertheless, it should be a good idea when you then go and act in the world to act as if the predictions are correct. It should be safe to take action, to take the same action you would have taken had the predictions been correct. Okay, so this is at a high level the semantics I want to pitch for trustworthiness of predictions. And of course, what exactly that means depends a lot on what you know, like what kind of action you're interested in taking, what your goals are, what the environment is. And so we'll see how you can sort of instantiate particular, you know, um, precise versions of this in different settings that will sort of correspond to changing what, what your goals are through some utility function. And we'll see that thinking through things in this way will allow us to recover a variety of downstream guarantees in different settings. And so the proposal, that, you know, the, the thing I'm going to talk about, it's going to build on a, a lot of ideas, um, you know, some of which go back to you know, the foundations of probability work on computable online calibration by David, the algorithmic work of Foster and Vora, Ricky's sitting over there. Uh, it builds a lot on multi-calibration and the work of, of um, this collaboration. Um, I'll try to call out specific points when they come up. And one, um, this collaboration, and, and um, the particular piece of work that sort of is, is um, intellectually quite related is this work on decision calibration by uh, Zhao et al. And Michael Kim is in the audience. 
over there. Okay. Okay. So I want to think about prediction through the lens of decision making. And so at a high level, I, I sort of want to think about the following pipeline. We've got data of some sort. We use that data to make predictions. And then someone else, not us, downstream, uses those predictions to make decisions. And it is through the lens of this decision maker that I want to think about whether these predictions were good and trustworthy or not. Okay. So in order to talk about things um, in this sort of pipeline framework, we need to think about how to model a decision maker. So let's say that you know, this is what a decision maker is. A downstream decision maker has some action space. This is the set of stuff the decision maker can do. Okay, these are the things the decision maker can do. And there's some state space, like what is a good idea for the decision maker to do depends on some state of the world that the decision maker doesn't necessarily know, right? Like, it, you know, there's not always a single best action that the decision maker can always take. It, like, depends on something. Okay, and this is the thing that our machine learning algorithms are going to be trying to predict, right? And formally, like, you know, the decision maker would know what to do if he knew what the state of the world was. He doesn't. We're going to try to predict that, and the question is, should he trust our predictions? And I'll think about the state of the world as some d-dimensional vector. And as we'll see, that'll capture lots of things. And how happy the decision maker is with his decisions, well, that'll be evaluated by some utility function that will map an action, the thing that the decision maker does, and a state of the world with a number specifying how happy he is. And I'm going to assume that this utility function is linear in its second argument. So it can be totally different for each action. But fixing an action, it's linear in the state. And at this point, you might sort of worry, you know, OK, linear, that sounds pretty simple. Like, maybe this doesn't capture much of interest. Uh, but it does. So for example, um, if my, you know, if there's sort of d discrete states of the world, then it might be that the thing that I'm predicting is a probability distribution over these states of the world. And the decision maker could have entirely arbitrary, entirely unconstrained utilities for each action uh, state pair. And if what I'm predicting is a probability distribution over the state of the world, the utility function, the expected utility, will be linear just because of linearity of expectation. So for example, maybe Alice here is deciding you know, what to wear outside, and like what she wants to wear is relevant. You know, it's relevant what the weather is going to be. So maybe the thing that I'm predicting is a is a probability distribution over weather outcomes, like the probability of rain or snow or sun. And maybe the action space in this toy example is the things that Alice can bring with her when she goes outside. Um, and she could have some arbitrary utility function that maps the stuff she decided to bring with her and the outcome to how happy she is. Okay? And just by linearity of expectation, anything like this, where what we're predicting is a distribution over outcomes, it'll be a, it'll be a utility function um, of the sort that, that we defined, linear in its second argument. Uh, but of course, that's not the only thing it can model. Uh, here's like another example that doesn't correspond to predicting a distribution over discrete outcomes. Um, Suppose I'm interested in you know, driving from like Philadelphia to New York. Um, not today, but on Monday. OK, so this is um, a map annotated by traffic that Google produces when I ask it, not what is the traffic right now, but what is the traffic on Monday at 8.30 AM? So these are predicted. Uh, you know, this is predicted traffic. So here, the thing that is decision relevant to the driver might be uh, the set of all road congestions. You know, like how long is it going to traverse each road segment in this very large network? And the action space of the driver, if he's driving, let's say, from home to work or you know, maybe home to the Simon Center, is the set of all paths in this graph from his starting point to his ending point. OK, very large action space, by the way. This can be sort of exponentially large in the size of the graph. Uh, and his utility 
will be the sum of the, or you know, the negative of the sum of the congestions along the path that he takes, because he's going to tra- have to traverse every single one of the roads on his path, and his, his cost is going to sum up. Okay, so this is a different example of a utility function that is linear in the state that is different than a distribution over discrete outcomes. Okay, so, so like, and there's more stuff too, but this is just to say that this modeling captures a bunch of things. Okay, so that's the decision maker. Let me tell you about the prediction setting. This is going to be a sequential prediction setting against an adversary. So a sort of um, worst case prediction setting aimed at robustness. So we've got some context space X. Uh, This just contains all of the features that we think are relevant to the prediction task. So if we're doing weather prediction, maybe it's like barometric readings, what the weather was yesterday, things like that. And we've got this prediction or outcome space that you'll remember from our downstream decision maker. This is what he cares about. Well, that's what we're going to be trying to predict here. And we'll assume this is some um, convex set in R to the D. Okay, so for example, the probability simplex over D discrete outcomes or the set of all feasible road congestions, you know, uh, flow constraints form a convex set. And then what's going to happen in, in sequential rounds is that the learner will observe context, whatever features might be relevant to the prediction. The learner will then produce a prediction for what the state is going to be, a d-dimensional vector. Uh, and then they'll observe the truth. They'll see what the outcome was, another d-dimensional vector. And so, you know, how, how good are these predictions? Well, the way we're going to evaluate that is by asking what the downstream decision maker should do with them. So if our decision maker knew what the state was ahead of time, because their utility function is a function of their action and the state, they would know what action they should take. They should, they should play the best response to the state. They should play the action that maximizes their utility amongst all actions, given what the state was. So for example, if Alice knew already that it was raining, she could like look out the window, see the rain. She wouldn't have to guess. She could like bring an umbrella. The difficulty is that she needs to act before the state is known. Okay, like maybe, you know, the the traffic's gonna be different by the time I, you know, get to the end of my route. I need to pack an umbrella or not to the Simons uh, collaboration meetup, you know, like before I know what's, what's gonna happen tomorrow. And so Alice doesn't have access to the state that is sort of decision relevant to her, but maybe we've made a prediction for it. She has access to this prediction. Is it a good idea for her to act as if the thing we predicted was the truth, was correct, even though she knows that it might not be? Like, we're just making a prediction. We don't know the future. Okay, so we give her some prediction S hat. If S hat was the real state, the thing she should do is to best respond to it, should she still do that? Like, is it a good idea for Alice to act as if our prediction was correct? Okay, and, okay, yeah. This is the sense in which I want to ask, is the prediction trustworthy? Yes? Yes, we will will talk about this uh, shortly. Uh, Yeah, so so far it's not like well fleshed out what a good idea is, but that's something we're going to need to talk about. Certainty of the prediction? Yes, we will talk about things along these lines. Okay. So let me remind you about calibration. We heard a little bit about it in the last two talks. Um, Calibrated forecasts are just forecasts that happen to be unbiased, conditional on their own prediction. Okay, and when I write an expectation, implicit is a distribution here. We're in the online adversarial setting. What's the distribution? It's just the empirical distribution on forecasts and outcomes after the fact. That defines some distribution. So calibration means that the forecasts should be unbiased, conditional on their own predictions, Um, This is sort of just a simple sanity check on forecasts. And maybe you're used to thinking about this in the binary prediction setting, where, you know, how calibration is typically introduced is sort of, you know, for weather predictors, 
on 20% of days for which a weather forecast predicts 0.2, it should, in fact, rain. That's just this unbiasedness condition when the outcome happens to be binary and the prediction is one-dimensional. But we can extend this condition to d-dimensional outcomes, and there's no reason the outcome should be binary. This is the condition I'm going to call calibration, just generalizing this one-dimensional case to the d-dimensional case. The expectation of the outcome, which is a d-dimensional real-valued vector, should be equal to the prediction, which is also a d-dimensional real-valued vector, uh, conditional on the prediction. Okay, so of course, calibrated forecasts don't have to be correct, uh, but correct forecasts are calibrated. So, oh, but, you know, of course, like, unlike correctness, calibration has the merit that you can check if something's calibrated. You can, it's, a, it's a statistical task to audit calibration, which is not true for correctness, uh, and it's enforceable. We have algorithms that can guarantee that predictions are calibrated. Okay. And so a really nice thing about calibration, like one of the ways I've come to think about standard calibration and why it's a desirable property, is that it instills trust um, in predictions. So here's a, once you, you know, internalize the definitions and immediate theorem. This is the kind of thing that sort of underlies the connection that, that Ricky and Dean used to show uh, connections between calibration and, and correlated equilibria. It says that if the forecasts that we're making are calibrated, then for every utility function, like for every possible downstream decision maker simultaneously, no matter what their utility function is, the best response policy that acts as if the predictions are correct, that, that plays the action that would be optimal were the predictions to be correct, uh, is in fact be better than any other policy that is a function of the predictions. So you could try to be more clever. Right? The best response policy just maps the predictions to like the action you would play if the prediction was correct. You could think of any other policy that tries to outsmart the predictor in some way, be clever in some way, uh, map predictions to actions in any other way. And a, a very simple theorem is that amongst all such policies that you might consider, um, if the forecasts are calibrated, the best response policy is a dominant strategy. It, it outperforms all of, the other, uh, all of the other policies. Now, this is, of course, if your action is a function only of the forecasts. If you know other stuff that the forecaster doesn't know, maybe you could do better. And just as an aside, this is one way to think about what multi-calibration is doing. Multi-calibration lets you give statements like this conditional on other stuff the decision maker might know about the world, so long as you are multi-calibrated with respect to that stuff. This is such a simple theorem that I want to just, oh, and m maybe one way I would uh, sort of put it in the catchphrase is that if your forecasts are calibrated, then at least amongst policies that map predictions to outcomes, you cannot do better than to trust the predictions. Acting as if the predictions are correct is optimal amongst all such policies. This is such a simple theorem that I want to just prove it to you. This will be the only proof I include here, um, but like, I think it'll build into it. Like, if you know how to prove this, you can figure out how to prove the other stuff I'll tell you about. Yes? Can you use your seat mic, please? Not on this one. I'm yeah. here. So, okay. So the question was, um, you know, calibration. We know it's it got all sorts of weaknesses. It can ignore important information about subgroups so long as it's canceled out somewhere else. How can something like this be true? Oh, so the, the nice thing is this is for all possible utility functions, anything you might care about. But the, the thing you're concerned about, the weakness of calibration, it's sort of hidden in, in the statement that you're doing better than any other policy of the forecasts. So if the forecasts are not very uh, informative about the things you care about, none of those policies will be good. Good question. Okay, but let me just sort of show you this proof because it'll give you, I think, intuition for the more complicated things I'm going to talk about. Okay, so we've got this utility function. Um, we're looking at, say, expected utility over the joint distribution on forecasts and actions. Um, 
you are playing the best response policy. You're choosing your action as a function of the forecast, but we're evaluating your utility using the real outcomes. I can just break up this expectation as first the expectation over the forecasts, and then the expectation over the outcomes conditional on the forecasts. And since the utility function is linear in its second argument, the expectation comes inside the utility function. Calibration tells me that the expectation of the forecasts is correct, conditional on the forecasts. Now, well, if the outcome really was the prediction, best responding to the prediction would have been a great idea. And then you can just go backwards, take the expectation back outside, and, and you get the theorem. OK, so that's what's going on. It's taking advantage of the linearity of the utility function, but as we saw, that's quite, quite general. OK, so calibration's great. Um, it, should that be the end of the talk? So there's good news and bad news about calibration. So calibrated predictions, they mean what they say, and they sort of have this semantics of trustworthiness. Trusting the predictions is as good as any other policy. Uh, and, you know, like, even in these sort of stringent online adversarial settings, we've known for a while that you can produce calibrated predictions. Like, you might worry calibration's great, but you can't achieve it, but, like, you can. On the other hand, like... Often when people talk about calibration, they're talking about calibrating like one-dimensional predictors, things like the probability of rain. And a difficulty is that, you know, even if we discretize our predictions in D dimensions, there's like exponentially in D many predictions we might ask for. And calibration sort of asks that our predictions be unbiased, conditional on all of them. So there's like exponentially many constraints, which starts being tricky. And so the way this manifests itself is that these online calibration algorithms, you know, their, their computational complexity uh, grows exponentially with the dimension, and, and so does their statistical complexity. The regret bounds you get, like what your calibration error is as a function of t, sort of gets exponentially worse with the dimension. So calibration is something that is reasonable to ask for in one dimension or maybe two dimensions, but really doesn't scale well to sort of d-dimensional settings that might be most interesting for decision making. Okay. So let's, let's talk about maybe like a, an intermediate goal. So making predictions that have no statistical bias. This will essentially be um, uh, multi-accuracy, the way that Perkshit and, and Omer talked about it. So let's say that an event, which can be a function both of this external context, I guess it's not multi, it's more it's like a variant of multi-calibration, because it's going to depend also on your prediction. Let's say that an event is some arbitrary function that can depend on the external context and also your own prediction. And for this talk, let's just say what it does is it selects out a subsequence of rounds. As a function of the context and your action, it says this round is in the subsequence or it's not. It can also depend on other stuff and it can map to the reals, but forget about that. So maybe like a sub-goal is that we want to make predictions that don't have much statistical bias in D dimensions conditionally on these events. So if we look at the average of our predictions and compare that to the average of the outcomes, not overall, but on the subsequence of rounds for which the event held, we want that difference to be small. Now, this is a d-dimensional vector. We want it to be small in every coordinate. Okay, so calibration is just the special case of this, where we're predicting over some exponentially large grid of predictions, and the events are just the indicator functions that, um, that sort of the predictions um, are each of the elements in this grid point. So this is... It's like, you know, if we instantiated this with exponentially many events, we'd recover calibration. So, like, calibration is, is really useful. It's nice, but it's hard to obtain. So questions I want to ask are, first, for, you know, calibration gave guarantees somehow simultaneously for all downstream decision problems, all utility functions that depended on this state we were predicting. Maybe if we think about a, you know, particular downstream decision tasks, then we can give nice guarantees um, by asking for 
unbiasedness, subject to only a modest, like a polynomial number of conditioning events that are useful for those particular downstream decision tasks. And if the answer to this is yes, um, it would be nice to know if in the online adversarial setting we can make predictions that are guaranteed to be unbiased subject to only a polynomial number of conditioning events in this d-dimensional space. This is not obvious, by the way, even though the number of conditioning events we're asking for is, is polynomial, because the number of predictions we might have to make is still exponential in the dimension of the space. And so the usual kinds of approaches that involve you know, solving some minimax optimization problem, you know, it's like solving a game that has an exponentially large strategy space for both the learner and the adversary. Yeah. Or is the question like, so like for a like, you know, like for a particular decision making task, can we identify which events are are important to give guarantees for that decision making task, and just ask for unbiasedness for those events, not all of them? So the question is finding the unbiasedness. Not like question one is finding what are the right events to ask for okay. as a function of the, the task, and then question two is the algorithmic question: How do you do it? Is it important that the number is small? I think. Sorry, I missed that. Can you use your seat mic, please? I'm trying to, yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Lean. Press what? Speak. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. So um, I assume that this polynomial number is for efficiency. Yes. So what if you could somehow efficiently enumerate over a larger set? Yeah, it's a good question. So we haven't gotten there yet, but the answer is going to be our sample complexity bounds depend, have this great dependence on the number of events, but we do not have Oracle efficient algorithms. So the algorithms are going to have running time that involve enumerating over the events, but it would be a really, it would be really cool if you didn't have to do that. And we don't know if you can. But that's, a, that's a, I think, one of the most interesting open questions. Okay. So, like, let's start with something easy. Um, what is sort of relevant for a decision-making task? Um, you know, like, let's say I'm just deciding whether I should, like, bring my umbrella or not as a function of the forecast. Like, if there's a 99% chance of rain, I'm going to bring my umbrella. But if there's a 98% chance of rain, I'm also going to bring my umbrella. And also a 98, 97, and 96% chance. Maybe I have some personal cutoff at 70%. Other people might have different cutoffs. But... For me, I don't need to sort of stress too much about the difference between 98% and 97%. What is relevant for me is that the forecast caused me to want to bring my umbrella. And so why don't we think about um, these events, which are defined by a particular, the utility function for a particular downstream decision maker and a particular action they might take, uh, that are just the events, you know, does the forecast cause me to want to take this action? when I best respond to it. Okay, these events are closely related to, uh, to decision calibration that Mike Kim and others worked on. And so, you know, oh, and the nice thing about these events is that in D dimensions, right, there's sort of two to the D, like, calibration events, but if you only have K actions available to you, this is only a set of, for, for any particular utility function, this is only K events one for each action. So these are events that don't grow with the dimension of the space necessarily in size. And there's no reason why the events we care about have to be disjoint, like they're disjoint for one utility function, but we could ask that we un be unbiased with respect to these events for a whole class of utility functions. And so here's a simple theorem. Um, if I make predictions that are unbiased with respect to these best response events uh, for every utility function in some class. And then we've got a bunch of decision makers who trust these predictions. They act as if they are correct. They best respond to the predictions, which results in a sequence of actions. Uh, then, simultaneously for all of these decision makers, they will have no swap regret. What does that mean? It means that, you know, well, they took some sequence of actions. They enjoyed utility for that, given the sequence of states that was realized. 
if they look back and they think to themselves, you know, could I have done better by counterfactually applying some policy which would have mapped the actions I took to other actions? Could I have done better in hindsight? And the answer is no for all such functions, mapping actions to actions. Okay? So if we can get, so, so, so like as one like beginner theorem, if we can efficiently make these predictions with, you know, we're not talking about approximation error, but sort of, you know, if our approximation error goes to zero at the usual rates, like one over root t, then one thing we would get is the ability to make predictions that guarantee that simultaneously for a bunch of downstream users, they all have no swap regret at the optimal rate. And, and yes. So an example of this, if I'm understanding it. Swap would be like, I would decide, oh, every day that I brought an umbrella, I'm not going to bring an umbrella? Yeah, or I'll bring a parka or something like that. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, um, okay, so, so this is like pretty good if you have an interaction which the number of actions available to each player is modest. Because remember, like, what are the conditioning events we talked about that lead to this kind of guarantee? Well, it was the events that for each downstream user, for each utility function, we were unbiased, conditional on making predictions that caused them to want to take each one of their actions. So how many conditioning events are there? Well, it's the number of users cross the number of actions which is small if I have polynomially many users and each one has polynomially many actions, but is otherwise large. So starting with this, you might then want to ask, okay, um, is there anything we can do in settings in which the number of actions is really big? We don't want to condition on all of them. And so let me describe to you such a setting. Uh, online combinatorial optimization. And, and think about this as, you know, like an exemplar of this setting is the sort of driving to work interaction I mentioned at the beginning. So what defines an online combinatorial optimization problem? Well, we've got some set of base actions. Think about these as like the particular roads in the network. Okay, like Fifth Avenue between 21st and 22nd Street. But our feasible actions, the actions we play, are not just single base actions, but are subsets of the base actions, usually with some combinatorial structure. So for example, um, in the driving to work game, my actions would be the set of all paths from my home to my office in this road network. Each of those is a subset of the road segments. Okay. And now the state, for me, will encode some gain or loss uh, for each of these road segments, for each of these base actions. For example, you know, if I just want to get to work as quickly as possible, maybe the gain is just the negative of the commute time it will take to traverse each of the road segments. But again, people could have different utility functions. You might prefer scenic routes. You might like driving by water or something, even if it's not as fast. You know, there might be a, something you're trying to avoid. So maybe you like traffic. Right? Different people could have different gains. And this is the important part, the, the part that's going to give this low dimensional structure, even though there's a lot of actions. The utility that a user will have, um, given state and a particular one of their actions, which is a subset of the base actions, it's linear over the base actions. It is the sum of the gain that the user gets over all of the base actions contained within the action they choose. Okay, so it's like, you know, I have to pay for the congestion along all of the roads that I drive along. Okay? So this is, a, this is an interaction in which the action space is very large. Could be as large as 2 to the d if there's d base actions. But there's d-dimensional linear structure. So there's something that we can hope to grab onto here. Okay, so what are the kinds of things we might ask for? So let me tell you about something I'm going to call subsequence regret. So suppose I've got a, a collection of functions that indicate subsequences of days when I'm playing this driving to work game. So for example, it might be that one of these functions selects out the subsequence that corresponds to days when it's raining and I decided to take a toll road. Okay, say I've got some collection of subsequences. For such a collection of subsequences like script E, 
will say that I have no subsequence regret if my experienced utility interacting you know, with the world um, was at least as high, or yeah, maybe that should be like a max if it's utility, is at least as high as the experienced utility I would have had with the best fixed action in hindsight, but not just overall, but simultaneously on all of these sequences, which can intersect. So I want to do as well as the best path in hindsight, having carved up the world in all sorts of different ways. Okay, so swap regret is just the special case of this, where the subsequences happen to be the indicator functions that I took each particular action. But you could define these however you like. Okay, so let's think of events that are going to take advantage of this linear structure. Um, so let's define an event for my utility function and for a particular base action I have, like the block of Fifth Avenue between 23rd and 24th Street. It's the event that when I best respond to the prediction, my best response includes that base action. I play some path that includes the block of Fifth Avenue between 25th and 26th Street. And now I can aggregate together those events for all of my base actions. So this is now an event not for each action, but for each of the base actions, of which there are exponentially many fewer. And remember, there were these subsequences that I cared about, like, you know, I want to have no regret on rainy days when I take toll roads. So let's now just take the product of the indicator functions for the subsequences that I care about, and these events that just specify, did I take, you know, did, did my best response include each one of these base actions? Okay, so what if I'm, you know, what if I make predictions that are unbiased with respect to these, maybe for a collection of utility functions. And right, and how many such events are there? Now it's one for every utility function cross base action, not utility function cross action. So if you do that, then um, you find that for every downstream decision maker who's got a utility function in this set that we specified, um, they have no subsequence regret on any of the subsequences that we specified. So for example, the different utility functions could correspond to different source destination pairs in the graph. And you could, uh, what you could do is you could publish traffic reports that are a good idea to follow in the sense that what they guarantee you is no subsequence regret. Um, simultaneously for, you know, no matter what your home and office location is, say. Okay, so no regret to the best fixed action in hindsight, not just overall, but on rainy days, on Mondays, on national holidays, on days when the best route involves I-76, on days when the best route takes surface roads right after a Phillies game, anything you want to write down that can depend both on external context and the action you take. Okay, let me give another application. Um, this one's shifting gears a little bit to, from, you know, like decision making to machine learning. So, okay, remember, we're very good at making predictions these days, but like sometimes we have uncertainty about them. How do we communicate that uncertainty to a user? Well, one popular way is not to make a point prediction, not to say that like this little critter here is definitely a fox squirrel, but when we're, there's uncertainty to predict a set of labels, we might say, you know, gee, I, I don't really know what's in this picture. Um, it's not that I know nothing. It's not like a, like a hot dog or a pair of binoculars. It's some kind of critter, but like I'm not sure if it's a marmot or a fox squirrel or a mink or a weasel or a beaver or a polecat. Okay, so a, a prediction set is expressing at least two things, both some amount of degree of uncertainty by the size of the set, but also where that uncertainty lies by the, by the composition of the set. Um, and it might be, by the way, that like for the particular decision-making problem I'm interested in, um, this is good enough, right? Like if I'm a naturalist trying to, you know, 
do a do a survey of of like the critters in in some forest. It, this matters, but if I'm a self driving car and I'm figuring out whether should I, I should apply the brakes, I don't care exactly the species of the thing I'm going to run over. It's you know it's enough that it's a it's a it's a critter. Okay. Um, oh, and you know obviously like the prediction set should have some semantics, right? It should mean something, and so a typical kind of semantics that is used, for example, in the conformal prediction literature um, is that the prediction set should promise to contain the true label with some confidence level, like 90% of the time. We'll talk in a moment about what that probability has taken over. Okay. So how would you do this? How would you do this? Well, I think in all of these kinds of questions, a useful exercise is to ask how you would do it if rather than having your crappy unbiased predictions, you actually knew the truth. Like suppose someone told you the true probabilities conditional on the features. And I, you know, like don't think too hard about what it means, the true probability that an image contains a hot dog given the pixels. If you think too hard about that, you might become a philosopher. Let's just assume that someone has given you like the true probabilities, whatever those mean. Okay, so these are just, you know, conditional probabilities of labels, conditional on the features. Well, in this case, if our goal was to produce the smallest prediction set that had 90% coverage, there would be an obvious way to do it. We would sort the true probabilities from highest to lowest, and then we would start stuffing these true probabilities into our, these labels into our prediction set, uh, and we'd stop when we reach 90%. That would be guaranteed to get the smallest prediction set that has 90% coverage. Okay, so, so this would work. If you did this and you had true probabilities, you would find that if your goal was 90% coverage, you would get 90% coverage. In fact, calibrated predictions would work. If you had calibrated predictions, uh, you'd also get 90% coverage. Um, but here, this is like d-dimensional calibration, right? So like in like an ImageNet setting where there's like a thousand labels, this is asking for something extreme. You're predicting like thousand dimensional vectors. So, so we don't know how to do that. That's hard. But do we really need that for this task? So suppose given a set of predicted probabilities, we had an algorithm that told us what the prediction set we would use given those probabilities. We just saw an example of what such an algorithm might look like. Sort the probabilities from highest to lowest and stuff them in your prediction set until you get 90% coverage. Then, turns out, if you, if you just want this guarantee of 90% coverage when you, pr when you run your algorithm on your probabilities, you don't need that they be fully calibrated. You just need that they be unbiased, conditional on the events that your prediction set algorithm decides to include a particular label in the set. Again, if we have D labels for ImageNet D is like a thousand, calibration would have had on the order of like two to the D conditioning events that we would need, no bias with respect to. This is just D. And we could ask for this simultaneously for a bunch of different prediction set algorithms. Like you might not be interested in coming up with the smallest prediction set. Maybe you have some other idea. Or maybe you do want to come up with the smallest prediction set, but you know, like what you're interested in is different people are interested in different coverage probabilities. Maybe I want to be able to do this and I want it to work for 90% coverage and 95% you know, coverage and 72% coverage, right? I could ask that these that my predictions be unbiased subject to all of these events. And the result is that what you will have is a way of predicting class scores that has transparent coverage, meaning that if you use one of these prediction set algorithms to um, produce prediction sets from these scores, even though they are not true probabilities, the true coverage will be what the algorithm thought it was, right? Like the, the coverage calculated according to the predicted probabilities will be equal to the coverage calculated according to the real probabilities, okay? And so for example, if you did this for every coverage probability from, you know, like 100% down to 1%, you'd have like this one model that just produced these class scores. You could use it to produce prediction sets in this completely transparent way, and it would be correct. But we might want more. 
um, you know, so suppose we're making predictions about people. Okay, suppose we say, okay, you know, given your features X, our model predicts your blood oxygen level in 24 hours is going to be something, F of X, uh, and as a result, we're going to, you know, suggest or not suggest some treatment. You might reasonably ask the doctor how sure you are of this, and, you know, maybe she gives you a prediction set. She says, we have 95% confidence that your blood oxygen level will be within some interval. That's a prediction set. Well, you know, like, th there's a difference between what the semantics of this prediction set are if we have the true probabilities versus what they are if we merely have these unbiased probabilities. If we somehow had the true conditional probabilities, our prediction set would speak to this particular patient, somehow conditional on everything we know about this particular patient. Again, don't think too hard about what the randomness is over, somehow over the unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world. There would be a 90% chance that our prediction set covered the label for this patient. But if you use conformal prediction or the thing I just told you about, you're going to get something a lot weaker. You're going to get a marginal coverage guarantee. You know, syntactically, it looks kind of similar, but importantly, you're not conditioning on x. You're taking the probability over x. And so this is a statement about averages over people, right? Like, you know, the, the probability, what it's saying is for 90% of patients for whom we make predictions, the, the, you know, the set covers the label, but that might not be much comfort to you if you think you are different from a uniformly random patient. Right, so... Um, for example, you know, if you're part of a demographic group representing less than 5% of the population, it is entirely consistent with this kind of guarantee that for your group, like, we never cover the label. Okay. So if the groups were disjoint, you could just calibrate separately on each of these groups. But often they're not. Our patient could ask, you know, what about for people like me? And the question is, what does that mean? You know, the doctor could say, well, for African Americans under the age of 50, the 95% prediction interval is from A to B. For women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction interval is from C to D. For people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction interval is from E to F. This is just a manifestation of the same kind of reference class problem that, that Omar and Prickshit mentioned to us. And so one thing you might ask for that is a bit stronger is that your prediction sets should have their claimed coverage guarantees, not just overall, not just averaging over the whole population, but in a conditional way. Right? So for example, if my groups correspond to shape and color and luminosity, I want to cover 95% of labels for triangles and circles and squares, also for blue shapes and red shapes and green shapes, also for glowing shapes and non-glowing shapes, or you know, maybe for all of these groups, okay? And so I want to be able to give like a single prediction set, um, not a different one for each group, that is simultaneously correct, at least marginally, as averaged over all of the groups that our patient is a member of. This has been the focus of a bunch of work coming out of this collaboration. And one nice thing about viewing this through the lens of trying to make it, trying to give sort of class probabilities that are unbiased, subject to various conditioning events, is it is very easy to layer in any other conditioning events you want. So if you want that your prediction sets should have transparent coverage probabilities, not just overall, but for people from a particular demographic group, you just layer in conditioning on membership in that group. And one nice thing you can do is you can condition on all sorts of other stuff that might have been difficult to condition on otherwise. So for example, you can condition on prediction set size extremely easily. I can, I can ask that my prediction sets have 90% coverage on the days when I claim that I'm sure, when my prediction set has size 1, on the days when my prediction set has size 2, when I'm pretty sure, on days when I claim total ignorance, when my prediction set is huge, or any other conditioning event that you can think of that is a function of your prediction and therefore any decision of a downstream algorithm that's going to use that prediction, an external context. So any conditioning events are fine. You can layer those in and get these same kinds of transparent coverage guarantees from the same model, this one model, for any collection of 
downstream algorithms that are going to be using the class probabilities to come up with prediction sets. Okay. So that was a bunch of applications of stuff you could do. If only you could figure out how to make predictions, d-dimensional predictions in this online adversarial setting that were unbiased subject to a polynomial number of conditioning events. And so um, I, I want to briefly tell you about how you can do that. Um, and we're gonna, it's going to be an application of sort of a, a multi-objective optimization framework that we, was developed as part of this collaboration. And so let's start by just writing down our problem as a multi-objective optimization problem. Remember, what are the things that we asked for when we said we wanted to make unbiased predictions? Well, in some sense, we were asking for something for each of the conditioning events, for each of the coordinates of our prediction, and for each sign that our bias might be. Positive bias, we didn't want that. We also didn't want negative bias. And what we wanted is that for each sign, the bias of our predictions, given the conditioning event in coordinate i, should be small. The negative bias should be small and the positive bias should be small. Okay? So really, like, there's sort of 2 times the number of the events times the number of coordinates, like, constraints that we want to hold um, at the end of time after we've made these predictions. Um, we, we'd like them all to hold. And so here's sort of a, a slick reduction that wasn't from our original work deriving uh, this framework, but, but from, um, gosh, I should have remembered all the author names before I began that sentence. Nika Hagtalab and Hara Podimata and Hara's here, and what's why? <laughs> Yang. Um, OK, so um, we want to run a no regret algorithm. It doesn't matter which one. In real life, we use a slightly fancier one, but think about exponential weights, where each of these constraints represents like an expert. OK? And think about these experts as like cheering against our algorithm. The expert, or, or think about multiplicative weights, if you like, as cheering against the algorithm. Multiplicative weights would really love it if, for one of these constraints, it was really violated, violated as much as possible. So for each of these constraints, there's an expert. And in every round, sort of the one round contribution of the corresponding constraint sort of in the direction we don't want it to be, in the direction that makes the constraint violated, we'll call that a gain. And multiplicative weights is going to be like selecting amongst these constraints, trying to maximize that gain. Multiplicative weights wants us to have high loss. And so the no regret guarantee is that multiplicative weights, which is going to be maintaining a distribution over these constraints and experiencing gain that is you know, the weighted, you know, the weighted convex combination of the gain of these constraints in proportion to the weights it's maintaining on the distribution will be at least as high as, in hindsight, the constraint that turns out to be maximally violated minus some regret term, which is small. And so if we can make predictions that aim to make the left-hand side of this small, that aim to make the gain of multiplicative weights small at every round, that will guarantee, because of the regret bound, that the loss in each of these constraints must have been small at every round. So multiplicative weights is working against us, and we are working against multiplicative weights. What this is doing is it's reducing a, a k dimension, like a, a k objective optimization problem to a one objective optimization problem. Okay, and so, um, if we can make sure that the loss of multiplicative weights every day is zero in expectation, the, multi the, the maximum violation of any of the constraints will be equal to the regret term of multiplicative weights. And to the extent that you have fancier no regret algorithms, you have fancier bounds here. OK. So that reduces the goal to finding a distribution over predictions uh, such that the expected gain 
where multiplicative weights is distribution, is non-positive. Now, we can think about this as a zero-sum game. We are doing something, and then the adversary is doing something. And the nice thing about zero-sum games is order of play doesn't matter. So when thinking about how well you might be able to do here, you can imagine that the adversary goes first and commits to a distribution over states that you know, you're trying to predict. Well, and then, if, if the adversary committed to that, you could just predict the expectation of that distribution. And what would happen is that, well, your prediction would exactly cancel out an expectation with the adversary's action, and you'd, you'd have succeeded in your goal of making multiplicative weights loss uh, non-positive. So by the minimax theorem, like you don't need to know the future. There's something you can do which will guarantee you this. We just need to find it. So all we need to do is solve some minimax equilibrium computation. Of course, the difficulty is that we're solving for the, the equilibrium of a zero-sum game in which our strategy space is exponentially large. It's, you know, we have one strategy for every prediction we could make, but this is a d-dimensional prediction problem. And so up to any reasonable discretization, there's exponentially in d many predictions. So you can't just like, write this down and, and solve it in the usual way. Right? You can't even write down the game. Okay, but you can solve it uh, using sort of methods that, that sort of classical methods from learning theory. Um, you know, by running learning dynamics, simulating play of the game, um, in which the adversary uses some no regret learning algorithm, and the learner best responds. You just need to figure out how to implement these two operations. But one thing you can notice is that the particular objective that comes out of this desiderata, that our predictions not be biased, is linear in the adversary's action, which means that you can run algorithms for online linear optimization, which get no regret. So follow the perturbed leader, for example, run sufficiently here. And it's kind of hard, actually, to figure out how to best respond. The utility function is very much not linear in the, um, in, in the predictions of the learner, because those interact with these events, which can be arbitrarily complicated. So it's not actually clear how to best respond but actually, you don't need to best respond. You just need to get, you know, guarantee that the adversary gets non-positive utility. And a nice thing about this utility function is, remember, what would you do if the adversary told you their distribution? You would just play the expectation of that distribution. So it suffices in this case not to best respond, but just to copy the adversary's strategy, which you have in front of you, because you're running the algorithm. And so the upshot is that you can do this. You can make predictions um, that have bias that sort of goes to zero at a, at a nice rate, sort of depending only logarithmically on the dimension and the number of events and with root t. And the per round running time is polynomial in the dimension and the number of events. So maybe this is sort of answering Parikshit's question from the beginning. The regret bounds are pretty good in terms of the number of events. The running time is not, essentially because the algorithm needs to enumerate these events. A very nice open question is whether there are like oracle efficient versions of this, which I don't know the answer to. Okay, you can get some improvements sometimes. Uh, the bounds we get are actually better than this because we don't use multiplicative weights, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, upshot, because I've got only a couple minutes left. So calibration has very strong semantics for trustworthiness. Um, it, sort of, it means that trusting that the predictions are correct and acting accordingly is guaranteed to be the optimal policy amongst all policies that map predictions to actions. Okay, so trusting the predictions and acting accordingly is a good idea if the predictions are calibrated. Now, unfortunately, calibration is sort of not a reasonable goal in, in high dimensional spaces, sort of a reasonable goal in one or two dimensions, but not in d dimensions. Uh, but um, we do have this algorithm that can make d-dimensional predictions that are unbiased subject to any polynomial number of conditioning events. So somehow the hard part about calibration was not the exponentially large prediction space, but merely the exponentially large conditioning space. 
you can keep the exponentially large prediction space and get rid of, you know, if, if you make the conditioning space polynomial, all of a sudden you have efficient algorithms. And this is often enough to give very strong downstream guarantees. So for example, you know, in thinking in this way, we've got new algorithms for efficiently forecasting for no swap regret at optimal rates for any polynomial number of downstream decision makers. And for getting efficient subsequence regret in combinatorial optimization problems and also extensive form games, which I didn't mention, sort of the algorithms you would have used for this previously by, by Avram and Yishai Mansur explicitly operate in action space. And so take a long time to run if your game has lots of actions. So sort of informally, by using this approach, it lets you work in payoff space for which online combinatorial optimization has a nice low dimensional representation and sort of circumvent the fact that action space is very large. Um, we get efficient algorithms for predicting label probabilities with transparent coverage guarantees for any polynomial number of arbitrary algorithms that map predictions to prediction sets um, and some accuracy guarantees that I didn't talk about. Um, and you know, at some point we had to like stop writing this paper, but that doesn't mean that there's not other applications of this stuff. So with Natalie, who is there, and Han, who is there, next to Natalie, um, we were able to use the kinds of algorithms I've talked about to give new algorithms for principal agent problems um, in which we can give strong guarantees without assuming the kinds of things that economists typically assume, strong uh, prior knowledge of prior distributions. And I expect that you know, this seems like a useful way of thinking about things. So I expect that there's more. OK, so um, thank you very much. Uh, the paper containing many of the results I talked about is there. I've been having fun teaching classes related to this stuff. And thank you very much to the Simons collaboration, which has incubated a lot of the ideas that, that we drew upon in this. So, that sort of this is really, for me, work that is taking full advantage of the Simons collaboration. So thank you.